there. My name's Microgirl. Have you ever wondered how HEMTs work? Well, let me introduce you. HEMT stands for High Electron Mobility Transistor. All right, now let's talk about what an HEMTS is. High electron mobility transistor, you say? We already talked about that. Yes, it is a transistor. And as we know, transistors are used for amplifying currents or electrical signals or switching them on or off. But let's talk about what the mechanism is for doing this. So we apply a voltage at the gate. And in MOSFETs, doping within the material controls this current flow. However, in HEMTs, doping is not the main control of this current flow. Instead, it's what we call a heterojunction. This occurs when we interface two different materials with different band gaps. So here, if we apply a voltage to the gate, we're going to see a current from the source to the drain. And this is forming at the interface of these two materials where electrons occur. However, let's leave this phenomenon here for now. We'll come back to it later. Instead, let's look at different types of HEMTs because gallium nitride are not the only ones. Very often, HEMTs will include multiple layers of materials to control the band gap that is desired very precisely. In this case, I have shown three instead of two, but they can have many more. So again, at the interface, the N-doped gallium nitride serves as a source of electrons, creating a channel of electrons at the gallium nitride surface. So, gallium nitride has been the material we have been talking about, but many different types of materials can be used to create HMTs. In practice, any material with different heterostructures could be used for HEMTs if they can be grown on top of each other. However, in practice, the other most common type of HEMT is aluminum gallium nitride, aluminum gallium arsenide, and gallium arsenide. Additionally, sometimes you see indium gallium arsenide within these mix. Sometimes this is used as the channel material. Other times the gallium arsenide is used in the channel. Now let's talk about what happens when we have two heterostructures, aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride. I've drawn these two band structures right here. Now we have a electron affinity for the aluminum gallium nitride and a band gap for the aluminum gallium nitride. Of course the same is true for the gallium nitride. Now let's think about where the Fermi level is. I've drawn the Fermi level as an n-doped uh, material, so it's up near the conduction band. If the gallium nitride is intrinsic, we'll draw it near the center, as we usually do. Now it's time to start thinking about what will happen if we put these two materials together. If they're in equilibrium, the Fermi level must be constant. So these two yellow lines must be equal. This means we need to draw the, bring the aluminum gallium nitride band down and the gallium nitride band up. So here we see our Fermi level is constant and our band structures have been adjusted accordingly. Now, remember, the original uh, band structure is pinned at the interface. So, our aluminum gallium nitride band must bend up 
and our gallium nitride band must bend down. And then there's a jump in conduction. Up, down, jump in conduction. So this is what our band structure now looks like. And the interesting point is at the interface. If we look at the gallium nitride conduction band, it drops below the Fermi level. This drop below the Fermi level creates an interesting phenomenon. Let's look at it further. Now let's look at what will happen to an electron in the conduction band of the gallium nitride side of the heterostructure. So if the electron's in the conduction band, then it must be a free electron. The free electron is going to head towards uh, the down the hill where it is more energetically favorable. And its neighbor will follow until we get this agglomeration of free electrons at the interface of aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride. This is known as an interesting phenomenon uh, known as two-dimensional electron gas. Two-dimensional electron gas, also known as 2 deg, is the critical phenomena that occurs in HEMT. In fact, this 2 deg effect is what gives rise to the higher mo mobilities within the structure and gives the structure its name, high electron mobility. As micro girl, sometimes I feel like it helps to get a different perspective. Let's look at the lattice of the material. So gallium nitride forms what we know as wartzite crystals, sometimes referred as zinc oxide. So the gallium forms hexagonally packed, hexagonally close packed crystals. You can imagine these as the blue. Then the nitride comes and fits itself in the middle. And you can see the unit cell right here. This formation is wartzite. The crystal structure is important in the fabrication of these heterostructures. And, of course, the band gap affects the fundamental properties. So we need to consider the change in band gap of the two materials and the lattice parameters. So when fabricating these heterostructures, we can use molecular beam epitaxy or metal organic chemical vapor deposition. So when we grow these materials on each other, there is a limit to the lattice mismatch which we can grow a crystalline structure on the already crystalline structure. Now, let us return to our gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, HEMT. Gallium arsenide has a band gap of 1.5 eV. Aluminum arsenide, 2.25. Indium gallium arsenide has somewhere closer to 0.75 eV. However, look at the difference between the gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide structure and the indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide structures. The lattice parameters hardly vary in the first set of heterostructures, but in the indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide structure, they vary by 0 0.2, 0 0.02 nanometers. Now, this might not seem like a lot, but it's enough to cause stress so great that it's going to crack the crystal and not form a uniform crystal. Therefore, 53% is the largest Indian concentration that can be grown on gallium arsenide. I find looking at a phenomenon from multiple perspectives can be clarifying. So let's look at the two deg effect from a mechanical perspective. Here I have the crystal lattice of gallium nitride and aluminum nitride. These are two different crystal structures. 
gallium nitride has a larger crystal structure than aluminum nitride. Knowing that the heterostructure has two different material structures, what happens at this interface? Well, the gallium nitride is getting shrunk and the aluminum nitride is getting stretched. What happens is this takes the form of a positive polarization. And this free electron, he just likes to dance where the positive polarization is, of course. He's attracted to it. However, don't forget about the top surface. So the aluminum nitride was stretched at the bottom. Therefore, at the top, it's probably shrinking in. This creates a negative polarization. And the negative polarization attracts positive ions from the ambient to it. This means in order to prevent the HNT from failing due to positive charges in the atmosphere, we need to passivate this. Usually this is done with silicon nitride. The two concepts of 2DEG now come together and merge. We can look at how the stretching and the strain affects the electrical properties of the material now. Here, conduction, the conduction band is drawn as a function of the x-axis. We can look at the potential of the material um, and we see that the aluminum GAN is dropping towards the GAN and the GAN is rising. But at the center, the critical point we see is the potential has jumped up. And this means the conductance has jumped up. Of course, we have this two deck effect which is creating many, many electrons at the interface. It is 1.2 times 10 to the 13th centimeters squared. So this is what creates this effect. Now to be a little more numeric, let's combine, let's tie this all together. The strained electron gap can be described in terms of the original electron gap and a delta change in the electron gap due to hydrostatic strain and a delta change in the electron gap due to uniaxial strain. These next two parameters describe these, uh, these deltas. The C's uh, relate to the mechanical properties of the material and are called stiffness. The E of course is strain and the strain can be directly related to the change in lattice parameter. Now D is an interesting uh, variable. It is what's known as deformation potential. And this can be calculated or looked up, but essentially what it's saying is there is a change in potential due to this change in strain. Now let's briefly discuss the operation of these HEMTs. So if we apply a voltage source across the source drain, or there's a voltage drop across the source in the drain, we'll see a current in our channel region that we have been talking about. So the current drops down and goes across uh, the channel. So looking at the current characteristics of this HEMT, we see as we change the voltage across the drain source that there it is at first a linear rise in the current but then as there's no more electrons the, the current saturates and this is a simple explanation of how the transistor works now let's motivate potential applications for gallium arsenide HEMTs some of these include uh, satellite communication wireless communication TV signals and potentially your cell phone. Well, maybe not that cell phone. Um, more like an iPhone. Um, so all these require high frequency analog devices. And gallium arsenide can do high frequency because it has a very high electron mobility. 
Gallium nitride devices are just now coming onto the market. Uh, potential applications include military applications, satellites, and uh, aircrafts which require a broad range of frequencies. These, are de these applications require high power or low noise and the band gap of gallium nitride is 3.4, much larger than that of gallium arsenide at 1.4 eV. So this is why gallium nitride is seen as a potential solution for these devices. Thanks for sticking around and learning about HEMTs with me. I hope it's been enlightening and you've learned a little. This is Microgirl signing out.